Au ministère en charge de la culture, on parle de réussite. Hum, on est en droit de se poser la question de la considération qu'on a du peuple nigérien. Rappelez-vous des jeux de la Sensa de culture. Vous avez constaté la médiocrité de ce censé diriger notre chère culture. Un exemple, sur les disciplines en compétition, sur 28 pays, nous avons pu mobiliser que 3. <rire> Quelle honte Même le dernier a possédé une médaille. Les artistes présentes, Jabol Culture, Acte 6. Well, I think if you were to, if someone was to properly look at the um, the works of like all the great Greek historians, Hippocrates, Herodotus, um, they'll see the influence that Africa had on Europe as a whole throughout the period of ancient Greece. Um, the ancient Egyptians used to have things called mystery schools or mystery systems where they ran from Sudan all the way up into parts of Turkey, Ionia, places like that. Um, and what used to happen there was people used to go and learn, or certain people, if they were lucky enough, used to go and learn a lot of the information, like the term, what the Egyptians used to have is the term Neo. So a Neo was known as a student, or a Neophyte was known as a student, somebody who would go and learn, but they'd learn orally. So, hence that's why Socrates never wrote anything down. Um, I think a lot of people know the fact that the term know thyself is attributed a lot of the time to Socrates, but in actual fact, if you go to certain temples, um, in Egypt and in parts of uh, East Africa, you'll see the term inscribed and it predates Socrates and any of those guys. So it goes to show you where he was getting, he was getting taught. But for me, it just, it, it's prevalent throughout a lot of Greek history, how the ancient Greeks, how, how revered the Ethiops, which meant of the burnt face, um, how revered they actually were. And over periods of time, it's become kind of um, it's become kind of taboo to associate anything wise, knowledgeable, philosophical, intellectual with Africa, and that's what a lot of European historians and academics find hard to uh, to digest is the fact that these guys, from Socrates to Plato to Aristotle to Herodotus to Hippocrates, all these guys, they were taught or influenced by the teachings of Black Africans, ancient Egyptians. So I think one of the fundamental reasons why Europeans uh, in general, the European intelligentsia, um, scholars and academics, why they deny Africa their history, you know, from ancient Egypt all the way through to kind of the major empires from Mali and, you know, and, and Kush and all those, those kind of things is because of the fact that if you accept that these groups of people were responsible for your ascent into history, your ascent into what is known as civilization, then how the hell can you justify enslaving them? And that's part of the problem, is the fact that you've enslaved, you've tortured, you've committed innumerable acts of genocide on the same people that put you in the position that you are in, scientifically, philosophically, academically, and culturally, and linguistically, whichever way you kind of want to look at it. Um, and that's one of the fundamental issues, is the fact that the idea of race and racism as an ideology is only 250 years old. It was only at the start of the 17th century where we really started to see a change in, in the way that humans regarded each other. So it's a very new idea, it's a very pernicious and sick idea that, that people find it very difficult to undo because the Greeks never had the concept for race you know race before the 17th century was a group of people that shared cultural linguistic and geographical similarities whereas once the uh, JF Blumenbachs and certain anthropologists Charles Darwin and, and his kind of followers and descendants once they got their hands on the idea of 
breaking humans down into certain groups, um, then it started to become more prevalent. You had the phenotypic biological overview of what humans, who they are and what they constitute. And you know, obviously, you, you, you know, you've got the measuring of the skulls, cephalic in index, anthropometry, all these different sciences, pseudosciences were invented to try and put the white man up at the top and the African at the bottom. And this was all due to the fact that for hundreds of years before, Africa was the richest, most prosperous cultural hub or centre point of the world, which is why Alexander decided, you know, when he went to Cairo, or when he went to Kemet, why he called it Alexandria. That is where everything that, you know, the library in Kemet there, there's thousands and thousands of books. It's been documented that he took from the library of Kemet back into Greece. Aristotle did the same thing. Alexander never went anywhere without Aristotle. And a lot of the information that was in those books was used and plagiarized by by Greek philosophers. And it's not, I don't think it's a matter of trying to say, oh, you know, the, uh, the Greeks weren't doing anything. And I don't think it's about that. I think it's more to do with who influenced who, you know? People, if you, people don't look at Charles Darwin and say this guy came up with the theory of evolution completely on his own. He studied theories and schools of thought from kind of anthropology to sociology far back from his time and that's what people don't realize. But our people have been, as the Masons say, struck a blow to the head which rendered them dead. And they know because they're the ones who hit us in the head. At the east gate, carried us on a westerly course, buried us in the north corner where there is no light under an old rubbish heap. Huh? Placed a sprig of cas acacia or evergreen on the grave to show that there was still life in the grave. And we would not get up out of that condition if it were not for these kinds of metaphysics conferences and if it were not for our diligent study. Yeah.